when you do a book talk, um, you, you think about, you know, should I go chapter by chapter and say this, has, this is in chapter one, this is in chapter two. I, I didn't want to do that tonight. I wanted to do a deep dive into what's the, the is chapter two in, in, in this book, uh, which covers uh, the epical year of 1919, exactly a century ago. And uh, you will get uh, the contents of that chapter, but you're going to get also, as they say in marketing, a lot of bonus content that was not in the book, uh, that is not in the book, but um, uh, was sort of left uh, you know, out for editing, but also um, because look what happened since the book was published. Uh, it, it came out in May in, in the UK and then July in the US, but in June, early June, we have the Hong Kong protests. And I could not help uh, as I observed those protests, and I'm just, I don't profess to be any expert or have any special insights other than the same media we all read about Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, as I'll say in a moment, um, what I see going on in Hong Kong today, in contrast to many people who look at it and see 1989, I see a, a lot of features that have to do with 1919, uh, Shanghai and, and Bombay, and I'll explain what I mean about that in a minute. Okay, so in, uh, you know, I think I don't need to give very much background to this audience on what the May 4th movement was, but if you recall from your modern China history classes, uh, you know, a century ago, May 4th, 1919, the student protests in Beijing on that day. Uh, over the decision by at the Paris Peace Conference and, and the apparent news that Japan was going to get these concessions, these former German colonies in Shandong, um, and the official narrative uh, since that time in, in the, among the CCP and among uh, sort of even in textbooks, of course, is that that May 4th movement, 1919, represents the, the sort of grassroots or the, the, the sprouts of the Chinese Communist Party, which is founded, of course, two years later in Shanghai. And, it's the beginning of the 30-year struggle for the end of the century of humiliation, the end of imperialism, and, and you know, the, the, the day we celebrated, that, that was celebrated anyway, earlier this week. Similarly, in India, 1919 is also a very big year. It marks the start in India's national narrative of, nationalist narrative of Gandhi, uh, whose birthday was yesterday, 150th birthday was, was observed yesterday. Um, uh, a nationalist narrative in which Gandhi launches the non-cooperation movement against British laws that are going to carry over, uh, that were put in place during World War I to have all sorts of restrictions on public assemblies, anti-sedition, various other restrictions on the press. This event is also heralded by nationalists in India as a moment that culminates in independence in 1947. So in these broad historical nationalist accounts, uh, what goes on in Bombay, what goes on in Shanghai, they're just really data points uh, on the big national map. And what I want to do today, instead of looking at the national scale down at the city, is to flip it around and look at these protests from the perspective of urban politics in each city, and to show that they were not just local offshoots of a national movement, but they took on a life of their own and caused significant uh, and long-term political change in both cities, and also uh, if you look at the way in which things were diffused across the nation, uh, each country that is, uh, some very impactful results uh, over the next decade. So why is it important to uh, look at popular protests? Uh, if I need to remind this, you, know, you might ask, but uh, there are uh, important things we know uh, from the study of protests. Uh, one, of course, they can cause splits in the governing elite. You know, it could, it could be North Korea, it could be some really powerful looking, unified, totalitarian regime. Protests can cause splits in the regime. We saw this almost happen. Well, we did see the splits happen in Beijing in 1989, uh, splits that weren't permanent, but we did see elsewhere in the world, 1989 to 1991, protests that, that divided uh, Soviet and Soviet-supported regimes. Uh, protests can form new coalitions and alliances among groups in society that had never really connected before. Uh, we see this, uh, examples uh, of this in South Korea and the Philippines in the 1980s. Military regimes brought down by a, a combination of workers and uh, business, uh, I mean, ur urban professionals, I should say, and students who, uh, in their protests and in their uh, demonstrations in, in public squares in, in both cities, uh, brought down those governments. And finally, protests can generate actions on in issues that look like they can never be resolved. You could take the example of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. Uh, you know, a hundred years of, of this, this, this 
racial, racial hierarchies and, and legal uh, exclusions uh, for African Americans, protests beginning in the 1950s that began to uh, address and cause the government to have to address that intractable issue. Vietnam War, late 60s, and another example. So the point is that protests have a life of their own. They can, if they have, if they begin a cycle, they can have a life of their own and they can affect broad political change. This uh, uh, shot here from the New York Times earlier this week uh, shows you, and it's, it's a little small in scale there, but the yellow dots are actual numbers of protests going from June to just uh, October 1st. And the, the, the point of the arrows is to show in Hong Kong, yes, sorry, in Hong Kong. And the point of the arrows is to show how uh, one particular incident that happens in, in, in one of those protests, such as a police uh, beating of a protester, can then lead, be a cause of a future protest. And what's, you know, you look at this and you wonder, how long will this uh, continue? Are we in the middle, uh, and I think we are in the middle of something very important, just as the cities uh, of Shanghai and Bombay were in 1919. And one of the really interesting traits of the protests in 1919 is that they seemingly sprang from nowhere. Uh, I won't read the whole quote from Marie-Claude Berger, uh, who's sort of a, you know, founding, uh, a founder of Shanghai Studies in the West, uh, but her main point is that um, no particular organizations or leadership, uh, there were rallies and petitions and boycotts, attacks on public buildings, it starts to sound familiar, right? For weeks on end, the whole city in a recurrent state of agitation. Um, I get asked this frequently and I'm happy to reply. It, one, one kind of answer of, of why I compare Shanghai and Mumbai or Bombay, as I'll now continue to call it, um, Jeff Wasserstrom has encouraged us uh, some time ago to think about Shanghai in a global historical context. He, he wrote this article on Shanghai and Budapest as post-socialist cities back then. And then more recently, Arnab Ghosh, uh, who says, we can learn a lot about China, about modern China, by looking uh, at, at China through India. That, it, that means to say that uh, you know, we have the old impact of the West uh, paradigm that some of us may remember from, from graduate school or undergraduate, uh, but we can view uh, China's development and Shanghai's development, uh, not just through the lens of Western power and influence, but also through connections and flows and, and various other kinds of, of relations with India and with Bombay in particular. And what I'm doing in the book is not looking for you know, one cause for why all these protests happened uh, with such frequency in the two cities, but looking at how the two cities, through an encompassing comparison, uh, as it's sometimes called, how these two cities experienced the global political current of nationalism, the global political current of mid-century, uh, mid-20th century socialism, and in the late 20th and early 21st century, uh, whether it's an ideology or not, this, this notion of uh, high growth, urban-led uh, development. So today's talk is just about the first, but the book uh, attempts to, to cover all three. Uh, so as I said earlier, when I view the Hong Kong protests, you see here uh, the two pictures on the, on the left. Uh, you know, a lot of people see youthful, youthful protesters occupying public spaces and demanding democracy. They go right to Beijing and other cities in China in 1989. 1919 uh, resonates with me because uh, I think uh, we see uh, both then on the right and today in Hong Kong uh, protests against um, colonial power, a kind of colonial power. Controversial and talking to Hong Kong, but uh, let, let's let, let me I guess, bear with me. Uh, protests against colonial power and its local agencies and representatives. Protests that assert local autonomy. Um, and power, uh, uh, protection against an expanding colonial presence. Uh, and very interesting in my view, in Shanghai and Bombay in 1919, as in Hong Kong today, what are the protesters doing in terms of tactics? They are quickly moving in and out of symbolic, strategically important urban spaces. Uh, they are following, um, uh, they, they did in 1919, as the Hong Kong protesters are doing today, following Bruce, Leeds, Bruce Lee's lead uh, to be water in the face of the more powerful adversary. Now in terms of numbers, uh, we have 150,000 at the peak in 1919 in Bombay, uh, 
about 12% uh, of a city of one and a quarter million. Uh, we have a slightly less in a larger city of Shanghai, 100,000 at its peak, 4% um, in a city of two and a half million. And of course, these are both dwarfed by uh, what we see in Hong Kong. If those estimates are right from earlier this, uh, from, from July, uh, one and a half to some people said two million, 20 to 27% uh, of, of a city of 7.4 uh, million. Now, um, as we know, uh, you get the reference, um, we're not going to be obsessed with crowd sizes <laughs> uh, because the other politically I mean, impactful uh, uh, event that happened in Bombay and Shanghai, to a certain extent in Hong Kong, but uh, certainly in, in 1919 in those two cities, was that merchants closed their businesses. There was a merchant strike, a kind of you know, boycott, but it's really not a boycott because the merchants are choosing to go on strike by shutting their businesses down. Uh, there were, of course, labor strikes in both cities, and of course, st uh, and especially in Shanghai, uh, students uh, didn't go to class for weeks and months on end, uh, and, and part of a coordinated citywide strike. So uh, now, of course, you know I don't need to remind you. Specific circumstances are different. We're talking about the Treaty of Versailles and the reaction to, uh, you know, the European powers in the U.S. Uh, at, at, the, at the Paris Peace Conference, not honoring uh, Asian demands for self-determination and so forth. In Bombay, these reactions, as I mentioned earlier, are primarily about. They are about anti-British uh, imperialism, but they're also primarily about these new laws. Um, uh, well, laws that are going to be maintained uh, with respect to uh, violating and restricting civil rights. Um, and you know what the Hong Kong protests started over. It was the, the extradition. But even going back to 2014, uh, these sort of broken promises on political reform and encroachments on uh, rule of law and so forth in Hong Kong. So um, what do they have in common? I, I'm not going to go through evidence for all of these things, but I see uh, to a greater and lesser extent in, in, in 1919 in the two cities and 2019 in Hong Kong, uh, all of this going on. And um, what I'm going to do is now address three main questions in which many of these shared traits will stand out. So one of the questions is, uh, how were the, the protests in Shanghai and Bombay in 1919 and in the decade that followed connected, uh, if at all? Uh, how did the protesters use strategically the urban space for strategic purposes? This is where I, the, the pa title, Power of Place, comes from. Uh, and, and why did we see in Shanghai a, a, one, of, one of those important cross-class or cross-sectoral alliances happen there, but not in, in Bombay? Now, if you asked um, officials, especially British officials in either city in 1919, well, how are these protests connected? The answer would, if you look at the police reports, if you look at the newspapers, it's always um, Bolshevik agents, mm -hmm. infiltrators from you know where, have, have, have landed in this city and they're operating behind the scenes. So what does that start to sound like if we talk about Hong Kong 2019, the Western, uh, hostile Western forces, right? This is the, the, the same kind of pattern in which you know, everybody is happy, but the, these outsiders came and, and stirred up trouble. Uh, but in fact, the 1919 protests in Bombay and Shanghai were part of a global, especially an Asian-wide uh, phenomenon. Protests beginning really in Seoul in March 1st, the very famous in Korea today still, the March 1st movement uh, against Japanese colonialism. Uh, two months later, Chinese intellectuals, students in Beijing and other cities, they're very well aware of what happened in Seoul. Uh, and they, you know, I'm not saying that but for Seoul there wouldn't have been a May 4th movement, but they were, uh, they were inspired by, by what the, the, the Korean uh, students were doing in, in Seoul against Japanese colonialism. Concept of Wangguo, the, the, the extinguished state, which has a long lineage going back to the warring states, but this was used by Chinese intellectuals to mobilize the public and say, if, if at, at current rates of, of, of imperialist intrusion, we will be a disappeared state, just like India is a disappeared state, and just like Korea is a disappeared state. National humiliation days. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is the century of humiliation. We've heard that term with, with China, but um, in 1915, when Japan made the infamous 21 demands against uh, uh, China for territorial gains, uh, at that time during the war, of course, uh, this, these became known as. as there were two of them, National Humiliation Days, because the, the, the government uh, in Beijing accepted those, uh, those demands. 
And uh, we see in Bombay in April of 1919, uh, the, the uh, leaders in that city are launching National Humiliation Day also. So this, is this, this concept is you know, they're certainly talking to each other and it's connected in that way. And as many of you know, uh, this is not just a time of nationalism. The Russian Revolution has happened. The, 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 the Habsburg Empire has collapsed. The Ottoman Empire is collapsing. Um, the the uh, 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 you know, German uh, Reich is collapsing. So it, it's a, a time of incredible turmoil and incredible um, possibilities that people see for future politics and governance uh, to replace, maybe, the imperialist, capitalist uh, world order. Um, I won't go into great detail on this. We can talk about it later. But there's an interesting story in ways in which uh, Bombay and money from Bombay and money from Bombay traders uh, contribute to Shanghai's rise, particularly in the textile industry. Um, Victor Sassoon, you know, famous for building the Sassoon House, later, which was also had the Cathay Hotel, and that's today's Peace Hotel. Uh, that's under that photograph shows you under construction in the 1920s. He made all, all of his money in Bombay, and then in 1931, he decided that the, uh, the nationalist politicians in Bombay weren't going to be nice to him, and he had much better friends in Shanghai, so he went there uh, to uh, base his operations from, from Shanghai uh, in, in the 30s. Now, one of the things that's most important, I think, in terms of the connection between the two cities and the protests in 1919 is um, the fact of very similar political institutions. The Shanghai Municipal Council running the international settlement, 5,500 acres of prime urban real estate, 70, uh, sorry, 22,000, only 22,000 foreigners living in the international settlement in, in 1920, and something like 800,000 Chinese living in the international settlement uh, at that time. That number will go up, too, over the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the Bombay Municipal Corporation, the BMC, um, has authority over all of Bombay, uh, but it often has disagreements with the central colonial government in Delhi. And what's important to remember then is that these events going on in these protests, yes, the nationalist narrative story says that this is about imperialism and nationalism, but there are so many local discontent, uh, sources of discontent in both cities uh, at this time. Um, there was a, an attempt by the Chinese um, elites, commercial elites and gentry in Shanghai uh, in the early 1900s to start their own uh, Shanghai City Council to govern the Chinese parts of the territory. And in 1914, the, the sort of the warlord uh, slash emperor slash president Yuan Shikai abolishes the local uh, uh, experiment in governance, uh, abolishes the Shanghai City Council. There are riots and various other things against, uh, for example, the fact that the Chinese 800,000 living in the international settlement have to go, when they have a dispute, they have to go to the so-called mixed court, which is dominated by uh, the British and foreigners, so they get a bad deal in court. Um, in Bombay, there's no, um, you know, 1911 moment where we're toppling a, an imperial dynasty and replacing it with a new form of government. But World War I causes this massive rethinking of British governance, uh, whether the British can sustain the empire and the kind of things that might need reform. So on the slate in 1919, complaints over these limited voting rights, less than 1% of the population can vote. And the only way you get to vote is if you're extremely wealthy, holding large property assets. And then uh, getting to vote, you elect yourself to the SMC, you elect yourself to the BMC. And so these urban policies are all designed to help big landowners, big textile mill owners, and big merchants. And uh, the, uh, what, what happens in Shanghai in early 1919 is that the SMC says, we're going to have to raise taxes. And they raise taxes not on the, the, the wealthiest uh, uh, property owners, but on anybody paying rent above a certain level, including shop owners. So there's this, it, they are already paying some taxes, but now there's going to be a tax increase. The exclusionary racialist policies on public space, uh, the famous uh, public gardens in Shanghai being off limits, uh, being only allowed, allowing uh, 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 foreign residents of the international settlement to enter the park, other kinds of exclusionary policies. And perhaps most centrally, the war, 1914 to 1919, causes 
tenfold increases in land prices in Bombay, almost the, almost the same level in Shanghai, 300% increases in food staple prices, not much increase in wages, they may only go up 50%. So you have a lot of, of local um, economic grievances on top of these, uh, these political grievances. So there's fertile ground clearly for large scale protests, but this doesn't answer the question of how did these protests get started if they didn't have any real leadership? And how were they effective uh, in the long run uh, when they only, happened, they only had sort of weak coordination or leadership? And so to understand why they were leaderless and yet effective, I think it helps to look at how these protesters used the political geography of the city to their advantage, like we're seeing in Hong Kong today. This map shows you, uh, uh, this is from actually a, an old book by Jerome Chun called The May 4th Movement in, in Shanghai. I should have credited that, uh, that work. Uh, one city, three systems. Uh, one city, three states. It's, it's the French concession uh, that you see in the middle there with the dark lines. It's the Chinese, the southern city where the, the English says Chinese native city. And then the international settlement north of that dark line in the middle and containing the famous and the infamous uh, Shanghai race course, the so-called public recreation grounds, and the international settlement spreading uh, to the west and to the east uh, uh, that way. Um, fragmented sovereignty means that protesters and, and organizers can hop around and dodge whoever's going to repress them. So if we take, for example, the Shanghai Student Union, which forms in the middle of these strikes in Shanghai in 1919, they form in the international settlement. They have their offices there. They, if they had them in the southern city or in any Chinese territory, they would certainly be repressed by the warlord, the, the military governor ruling Shanghai, controlling Shang, uh, Chinese areas of Shanghai. So they're in the international settlement, but in the middle of this general strike uh, around June 5th of 1919, what happens is that the SMC says, hey, this Shanghai Student Union is, is, is seditious. We're going to shut it down. They shut it down. And then the SSU, the Shanghai Student Union, quickly just moves into the French concession, where the French are like, oh, OK, it's laissez-faire. Uh, so it, 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 all sorts of examples of this kind of hopping around to avoid repression that's possible in Shanghai, and it's, it's not possible uh, as in the same way in, in Bombay. Uh, Shanghai also famously lacks um, civic space, you know, uh, a square. Uh, a, a park where we can hold large rallies. Now, the foreigners in Shanghai uh, frequently, whether it's you know a British holiday or a German holiday or a Japanese holiday or an American holiday, they all go out to the race course and you know do a parade or whatnot, Fourth of July celebration. Chinese business elites and others say, well, well, why not us? Why can't we have such a place? And in 1917, they established the a much smaller uh, public recreation ground, which you see this little square here. Now it's small, uh, and it happens to be near the west gate of the old uh, walled, no longer walled Chinese city. Um, this place is, is really interesting because it becomes um, the staging grounds for all the big rallies in, the, in 1919 and in the decade that follows and even in the 1930s. And uh, I think, yeah, I have one, uh, quote from the North China Herald uh, from 1925, but it could have been written in 1919. I won't do it with the British accent, but you can imagine, and you'll hear some, some uh, kind of British turns of phrases uh, by this very concerned reporter. And he says, um, quote, inflammatory anti-foreign speeches of the kind which find favor at the West Gate or the Chinese recreation ground are too common to be worthy of notice. In fact, if a speaker does not denounce somebody or another, his popularity would be rapidly on the wane. It is not uninteresting to attend these meetings and hear male and female demagogues screech themselves hoarse on behalf of some cause or another. And then the close quote. The article goes on to talk about how after a rally uh, that this reporter observes, the crowd marches through the the, the Chinese native city, then they go into the French concession in small groups, and then they finally get into the international settlement where they've hidden all these banners and flags, you know, denouncing the British, denouncing uh, imperialism, and then they unfurl them in the middle of the street of Hunan Road. And the reporter uh, goes on to conclude that, quote, 
One cannot get away from the fact that here was a very well-organized movement, close quote. But then in the next sentence, he says, according to a Chinese official source that I have interviewed, uh, there are Bolsheviks behind this, <laughs> this march, for sure. And so you know, there again, Western hostile forces being invoked. Okay, uh, quickly, um, here's a picture of, of the PRG, the Public Recreation Ground, in 1919, when there was the, the first uh, of, of several rallies being held there. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the, uh, from the, the newspaper, Shanbao, uh, which is also housed in the international settlement because it would be heavily censored if it were in China, Chinese territory, uh, this uh, Chinese language, uh, obviously, newspaper um, is talking about a boycott that's going on. And this happens to be June 3rd. Two days after this uh, article appears, the big general strike that's going to last, uh, that's going to involve students not going to class, workers quitting jobs, including drivers, chauffeurs of foreign residents in the international settlement. They, they hand their, their uh, foreign employees a card that says, I'm going on strike to, to make common cause with my fellow citizens here in Shanghai who are very upset about, yeah, they say it's about nationalism and it's about Japan, and it's about the humiliation. But, you know, as I'm trying to underline, there are also these other local grievances that are at play too. And the shops are closed. So it's a student strike, labor strike, merchant strike going on for uh, eight days until June 13th. So what this general strike shows, Shanghai has a seriously discontented local population. and it's going to be a problem for the Shanghai Municipal Council and for the French concession government uh, you know, for the rest of their existence. The Shanghai Municipal Council, the International Settlement, is finally shut down in uh, 1943. That's another story entirely. But just six years after these 1919 protests, you get to the year 1925, and you have the May 30th movement. Some of you will be familiar with that. And that is like taking what happened in 1919 in terms of general strike, in terms of boycotts uh, and, and, and multiplying it by 10 uh, in terms of its scale and in terms of its impact. But 1919 sets the stage. With Bombay, uh, we can see here the, uh, in the inset of this map the area called the fort, which is, uh, appears here on the, uh, the main map. This is the, the administrative uh, district with the famous uh, the BMC uh, tower that you saw in the earlier picture is located here. The famous train terminal, Victoria Terminus, is here. Um, and of course, you know, the, the biggest contrast, in stark contrast to Shanghai, besides the fact that it's one city, one system, uh, is that the British there have absorbed many local communities into governance. So you may have noticed back when I had the SMC BMC, the BMC has 72 seats of very wealthy you know, landlords and mill owners and so forth, but they come from the local population at least. They've been kind of co-opted and brought into the governance system, even, even in 1919, and this will continue. Um, one of these was the Parsis, and I can talk about the, the Parsis, very interesting um, trading family from, from Gujarat who owns a lot of mills and did a lot of trade with, with Shanghai, as a matter of fact. Uh, in Bombay, uh, also in contrast to Shanghai, there's Lots and lots of civic space. These uh, Maidan uh, that you see, uh, that's the same word we hear in lots of, I mean, I'm thinking of Ukraine has, in Kiev, there's the Maidan protest. This is the same, it's an Urdu word for an open ground or something like this. Anyway, the Azad Maidan that's pictured here on the right in the 1930s, very famous uh, civic space for protests. Um, these are important venues in 1919, in 1920s, uh, and even in the 1930s. But in Bombay, as I've said earlier, there's never that cross-class protest that we see happening in Shanghai. Now, in part, I think this is because uh, Bombay University students, unlike their counterparts in Shanghai, never have a real autonomous organization of their own. What is it that, that they're doing? They are, I think, uh, and there's the, 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 lots of conversations I've had with historians in Bombay about this, but. Uh, essentially, they're being co-opted into the, the ruling class uh, and not excluded. I mean, in Shanghai, university students, if you go back you know, 10 or 15 years earlier, they're thinking about Confucian exams and entering the civil service through that, that route. And now, you know, the, the, that's been abolished. And the Qing dynasty and its governance has been abolished. So there's sort of this, 
you know, more revolutionary possibilities for, for Shanghai and other university students in Chinese cities uh, at this time. Um, and what's also interesting is that Bombay workers, in contrast to Shanghai workers, especially textile workers, where are they linking into? The Bombay textile workers are tightly engaged with the Communist Party of India. The Communist Party of India, begun in 1920, uh, was very successful, not because of the Bolshevik influence sent from Moscow, uh, although one or two people were, but they, they uh, uh, make these really tight connections with the neighborhood and with the, the textile mill workers. Uh, and several studies have shown how these neighborhood and workplace effects, uh, the communists use them to great advantage. And so these workers were, were following the Communist Party lead, not because of ideology, but because they were, the Communist Party was really focused on real issues like wages and working conditions and housing. Uh, so instead of in going back to 1919, in April of 1919, what we see is a largely middle class uh, protest drawing on English speakers and Gujarati speakers. Here you see on the right a call in July of 1921 to uh, burn foreign cloth. Uh, you, you bring your foreign cloth to the Maidan near Elphinstone Mills, and we're going, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, our you know, national leader, is going to uh, ignite this thing, and, and special arrangement is made for ladies and children. Um, so that's going on. On the other side, you see the actual April uh, 6th event being advertised uh, in advance. And you also see, uh, if you look um, at the, um, uh, where is Gandhi's name is here. Mahatma Gandhi is a speaker among two, uh, another uh, speaker uh, that day. Gandhi is very interesting. Um, you see him in both posters. He has a very complicated relationship with Bombay residents. Um, he has hardly any social connections in the city. But at different times, uh, you know, during this movement, uh, he is telling Bombay activists, you know, follow my directives. Okay, so he says we're going to have National Humiliation Day, also known as Black Sunday, on April 6, 1919. He, didn't even, he did not want to have actual protests in marches in Bombay. He didn't even want to come to the city at all. He wanted to have a solemn religious-like uh, ceremony where we, we, we first uh, purify ourselves uh, at the ocean, uh, at the beach, and then we, we quietly walk through the streets uh, to display our, our uh, non-cooperation with the British. Um, what do local activists in Bombay want to do? They want him to come, but they want to have uh, a general strike with rallies and marches throughout the city. Uh, in fact, they said, look, we just had three months ago in January of 1919, 150,000 textile workers went out on strike. They paraded all through the city. They got their demands met. We want to do this uh, on March, uh, on April 6, 1919. So Gandhi and the activists, uh, Bombay activists have a a lot of discussions, a lot of compromises, and they finally come up with a hybrid. So it's interesting if you see, uh, we're going to get up at 7 a.m. and go to Chalpati Beach and have our uh, sea bath, our, our ritual purification ceremony, and then we're going to march to all of these places around the city and give speeches and hold, hold rallies and so forth. Uh, the workers, what happened to those 150,000 textile workers? They bring Gandhi to the textile mill neighborhood two days before this event, and he says to them, um, we would like you to participate in the April 6th march, uh, but you first have to ask your employer if you can have the day off to come join in the march. Uh, and that you know, turned them off quite a bit. Uh, and so, you know, not surprisingly, you know, they're, they're more likely to be receptive to Communist Party organizers who also literally speak their language. The Marathi language is the language of the textile workers. Gujarati is, is Gandhi's uh, language. And even though if you're really paying close attention, you say, well, it was a Sunday. It doesn't matter. Textile workers have to work on Sunday. So they, they would have, uh, they, they, they did work that Sunday, as a matter of fact. Now, for those of you who, uh, let's see, maybe the best cultural Reference here is the movie Gandhi from 1982, you know. Um, what did we see in that movie? You remember the scene where the innocent protesters, or did not protesters really, they were assembled in this walled compound and the British colonel ordered the troops to open fire on them and massacred 400 of them and injured over 1,000 of them. That's the infamous Amritsar massacre. And that took place April 13th, just one week 
after. Now, Amritsar is, is in Punjab. It's, it's, you know, quite a ways from Bombay. But the news of that massacre gets out and leads to lots and lots of, of it marches, riots, uh, kind of uncontrolled uh, forms of, of protest uh, and, and all sorts of vandalism and so on and so forth. And what does that lead to? Then a counter uh, attack, a reaction by the British security forces to really clamp down uh, and trigger a widespread uh, uh, you know, crackdown uh, on, the, on the city, uh, Bombay and others. Uh, but the protests and the strikes and the boycotts continued in Bombay throughout the 1920s and 30s, but they did so, workers doing their thing, uh, merchants and middle class doing their thing, and students doing nothing except maybe volunteering uh, for, for, for the merchants, for Gandhi's uh, people and other uh, political organizations. So, uh, you know, to quickly sum up, why the cross-class alliance in Shanghai? Okay, yes, you have Japan, an easy rallying cry, a contributor to cross-class um, coalitions, but what I want to say is that that is less important in 1919 and the 1920s. It's much more important as a driver in the 1930s of Shanghai's cross-class, uh, you know, uh, arrangements. Um, so it is primarily in these early years, in 1919 through 1930, I would say, it's that fragmented sovereignty and the SMC as a target. I've already talked about the contrast between student politics in Shanghai and Bombay. Talked about the, the worker, the Communist Party of India making deep linkages with Bombay textile workers especially. What about the Communist Party of, of China in Shanghai? Complicated story, uh, making, yes, big inroads and mobilizing this huge thing in 1927, the armed workers uprising, but not having so much inroads with the textile workers. Um, uh, as, as one, uh, as, as certainly as you would see in the case of, of Bombay. And then infamously in April of 1927, Chiang Kai-shek and the Guomindang right wing comes in and there's no more Communist Party, uh, at least above ground in Shanghai until 1949. It's, it's all repressed and, and underground. Um, one uh, final interesting thing that I haven't touched on yet is that you see in uh, the Chinese uh, documents and in speeches, this, this concept of the shimin, the urban citizen. Um, shimin versus guomin, uh, 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 national citizen. Mm -hmm. This word changes meaning over different times in the 20th century. It's really quite interesting. Um, and, and during the heights of the mobilization in 1919, well, I should say in the early 20s and in the mid-20s, this, this shimin concept really um, produces a kind of citizenship consciousness among your, 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 we are all Shanghai people and we are all uh, in this cross-class coalition and we're going to mobilize against uh, the SMC, we're going to mobilize later against Japan. Um, if we have, how are we, I know we're running short uh, pretty soon on time, but um, let me, I can come back to the tale of two editors, but it is, it is pretty interesting. Um, in terms of the outcomes, you know, the short-term outcomes, we see expansion uh, in modest expansion in voting rights after 1919, but even by the late 20s, we see serious expansion. And even in 1920, the SMC agrees that, you know, there's there are nine of us foreigners, we will have a Chinese advisory committee. And, and after the May 30th movement, they actually then introduce uh, voted uh, or seats for, for Chinese representation on the, on the SMC. National products movements, and which, which promote Chinese uh, produced goods, and Indian uh, national product movements, which promote Indian uh, manufactured goods, are very prominent after these 1919 protests. You begin to see lots of labor legislation introduced uh, out of fear of further strikes in both countries, especially in, in, in Bombay, especially among textile workers. And then you have a whole decade of, of, you know, these protests, again, going back to that idea of they're leaderless and they're disorganized and they, they cause organizations to form rather than the other way around, an organization starting a protest. So in Hong Kong, uh, what do we see? We've seen some cross-class protests on a few occasions, you know, middle class and professionals coming out to join the students, workers too. We see certainly demands for higher levels of autonomy or maintained levels of high autonomy or 
you know, uh, following the basic law to the letter. Uh, we see constantly uh, demands for direct election of the chief executive uh, and, and broader representation on LegCo. We see, as we all know, the strategic use of space, uh, of the, the, going to the airport, using the metro stations, using the shopping malls uh, as venues of protest, the tour, other tourist districts, social media, huge. And I, the, the thing I can come back to is, is uh, you know, the, the newspapers are the equivalent of social media in 1919, and they're just as flashy and just as able to deliver, not as rapidly, of course, today's social media, but they have that effect of, quickly delivering information and, and, uh, um, and news of a police shooting, for example, to the citizens of Shanghai and Bombay. And then um, you see it's less talked about in Western media, but boycotts. Uh, you know, Maxims has gotten in trouble in Hong Kong and various other, you know, uh, it, it's, it sort of goes both ways that if you're too pro on the side of protesters, then you get in trouble with Beijing. Uh, but they're, they're, and so there are calls for boycotts uh, of such and such product uh, by Chinese nationalists because they support the Hong Kong protesters and vice versa. And then you also see that interesting uh, word, shirmin, being used. That's not new. It's been used uh, a long time in Hong Kong, but it is, I think, becoming an interesting part of Hong Kong identity to distinguish from being a guomin, a citizen of, of the, the PRC. Um, now, are these Hong Kong protesters? Reading uh, and using 1919 Shanghai, for example, as a guidebook? Um, no, no, definitely not. I mean, that would be interesting, but let's see. I would also, you know, I wouldn't be opposed if, if 1.4 million of them bought the book. That would be nice. Um, I'm happy to help them learn about 1919. Um, but, you know, I think the reason we find similar repertoires and tactics uh, has a lot to do with the you know, the fact that Hong Kong is also a British colonial city and has this legacy, has the, you know, nowadays, of course, it's not so much that it's a, the, the formerly British colony, but it has the PLA place, and it has the LegCo, and it has the executive, it has all these centers of, uh, and symbols of administration and, and colonial, semi-colonial power that become the target of, of the demonstrators. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is that in all these protests, and it's the three cases we've talked about tonight, but anywhere, any protest, it's got the protesters, of course, and it's got the target, the government, usually. And then who's the third most important actor that both sides, especially the protesters, are aware of is the audience. Mm -hmm. And the audience might be uh, just somebody there on the scene watching, but more likely uh, it's the audience who, uh, you know, through the media <coughs> and news reporting about these events, are seeing them uh, almost in, in real time as we are today, responding to them. And I think the protesters are acutely aware of that and, and you know, draw their decisions on where to go and whether to wave American flags today or not, consciously aware that this is, you know, this is, on, this is going to be broadcast around the world, that the world is watching this kind of effect. And, and of course, this is, this is common, like I said, not just in these three cases, it's common in uh, the Arab Spring uh, protests that we saw. Although, interestingly, what happened with those kinds of, of protests, Arab Spring, as well as some of the color revolution places, they, those protesters, generally speaking, seem to want to you know, go to the Kiev Maidan and stay there. They were not doing the be water uh, approach and, and moving around uh, the way we see in Hong Kong and today and in Shanghai and Bombay a century ago. So thanks very much for that, and I'm happy to go over anything I went over too quickly or skipped altogether. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Can we go back to that map of Shanghai? Yes. Because this is um, a fascinating book that I got last Thursday, Friday, and I actually finished it. Oh. Uh, nice. Not you know carefully one by line, one by <laughs> one line, but uh, I actually read it quite carefully. Um, so I was just fascinated on three key themes, and I think I'm going to ask you about these three key themes. Coming as a um, urban, you know, a student of cities, right? Yes. I, I was really excited to see your using the political geography mm -hmm. um, uh, narrative to look at uh, how protests and discontent relate to space, right? Not just not just place, but also space. Right, the different space in that place. And as you were presenting, actually, some of you definitely gave us some extra 
bonus know, meet, concert. Yes, <laughs> uh, here. Um, I, but I'm still kind of interested in, so whether the place is just the container, right? So you're talking about a strategic use of different space, right? In these, uh, this is the Lao Ximen, right? The, you know, right, the, the, right. the West Ximen, Gate. Right. Now Metro um, stop. Or they are more of even a catalyst, right? So, I mean, the question of urban, what's so different between yeah. urban and rural is the density and the proximity. And you talked about how quickly, you know, the message of uh, strikes would spread, right? That has a lot to do with, you know, how people just live next to each other in a sense. So I'm really interested in uh, how you see, because I think in the book, the two narratives also are uh, both there. So you're saying that the, the, the inequality that are very uh, clearly shown spatially, and especially, I think, in Shanghai, right? So you have the intersection of the concession areas. My grandmother actually used to live in the French concession uh, on Huaihai Road. Oh, yeah. and, um, uh, and, and then the, the Guen Di Long, right? The, the, yeah. the squatter settlements, in a sense, and right next to the factories and so on. How these actually produce the kind of discontent because of this high density extremity, but it's also juxtaposition with the very rich, you know, mm -hmm. at the same time, actually become more of a catalyst. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I wanted to push you to, to, to give us a sense of whether the political geography is not just the container. Right. Okay. And then you talked about in Bombay, so the work and the housing seem to be together, mm -hmm. uh, sort of more integrated in, in that sense that maybe that restrained a little bit of the cross class uh, that you were talking about, the alliances. So that's my first okay. question. So okay. you go ahead. OK. You know, I, I think. Um, yeah, this is uh, a, a debate, as you know, still in, in urban studies and in you know, so-called critical urban studies, where the, the the places we live in determine our consciousness. You know, and, and not a, not in a class way, but mm -hmm. but in our our thinking about political and social things. That that social relations are a product of <laughs> the places we live in, right? Mm -hmm. And so. Um, you know the 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 counter to that is no. It's it's our ideologies and our religions and our other things that determine our social. So uh, you know, without getting too like broadly theoretical about it, I think what I'm doing in the book is to say that um, place and 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 civic space and informal settlements can be a catalyst for protests, given certain conditions, given certain leadership. I mean, what I certainly don't want to say is that, you know, all these protests are a product of the structure and the shape of the city. Um, but but w the, the, the mechanism that I think produces that is the ways in which um, the, the spatial inequalities that you mentioned and the visibility of, of, of extreme wealth, extreme poverty um, can create um, kinds of identities of, of who is a real Shanghai person and who is a Wai Di Ren, right? That famous uh, distinction. Same kind of thing happening in, in Bombay, despite the, the you know, important differences in the political geography. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, I would say that place, the power of place is there and it can, call, it can be a catalyst for protests. Um, but under certain conditions. So not every protest that happens in a city is because of the shape of the city. If you have a climate change protest or if you have a, a, a civil rights march or something like that going on in a city, um, then yeah, sure, the protesters can, can march down the main avenue and they get a, a parade license or marching, a protest license and all that. But that doesn't, that's not a case in which mm -hmm. the city and its legacies and its urban forms are you know, uh, creating uh, notions of exclusion and inclusion in people's minds, the way some of these protests uh, that I talked about were mm -hmm. in, in 1919. So with that, I have sort of the second question, is mm -hmm. that you talk about how, you know, in the book, nationalism, right, the, 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 the driving narrative of nationalism uh -huh. united mm -hmm. in many ways during that period of time, the different groups, particularly yeah. in Shanghai, right? And this makes me think, you know, the very first CCP um, conference was in Shanghai, right? Yep. So it sort French of concession. started the, the spark 
of the um, communist uh, you know, sort of path to power, right? It took mm -hmm. another uh, three decades, actually. So this reminds me in a way that that period of time in the 20s and even in 1919, I was not too far from when the Bushwick Revolution took place. Mm -hmm. But if you, but I read your book with fascination in a sense, you look at India, uh, Bombay and Shanghai, you almost see this could have, maybe the socialist revolution would have happened earlier. Then you realize, yes, there was an urban bias, particularly in the case of China, but overall, Shanghai was an island of modernity. It was mm -hmm. a very small part of the country. And, and then I feel that, so, so Mao actually had to take that spark through the rural path right. to actually achieve a momentum of a class-based revolution. Mm -hmm. So you talked about, you know, whether it's class-based or nationalism-based. Right. So yeah, in the sense that um, I would have loved to see in the book more of the discussion, so I wanted to hear from mm -hmm. you that uh, the, the sort of the rule of mm -hmm. Shanghai in that period of time in terms of particularly propelling, um, you know, sort of Mao saying a spec to the right? So sort of to the large uh, plane. So the, how that actually facilitated or promoted the communist uh, path to yeah. power. Yeah. I mean, I think a, a general um, point is that the early advisors to the communists were saying, you know, if this revolution is going to happen, it's going to happen in the city. And if it's going to happen in a city, it's going to happen in Shanghai because it has the most advanced industrial base and, and therefore the most class exploitation. And so this is the this is the place that it's this is where we need to concentrate our efforts. And you know, I think as, as we all know from the histories of the party that the, there's a huge learning curve that goes on where it turns out that Shanghai is not the place where we're going to succeed. Um, you know, even even with great levels of deprivation and modest success, and, and even in 1926-27, some serious success in wiping out the, in, in, in driving out the, the military governor running the place. But of course, that was in the context of the Northern Expedition, the Guomindang and the communist armies are arriving soon. And so the worker, you know, you have this story of the Shanghai Commune where the workers take over the city for a few weeks. But, you know, obviously quickly the repres repression comes. And then, um, you know, uh, Moscow largely and Soviet agents are telling Mao and others, you know, do an urban uprising in Changsha, do an urban uprising in this mm -hmm. city. And they just get wiped out continuously until Mao says, you know, um, maybe the, the countryside <laughs> will have greater <laughs> possibilities for revolutionary uh, mm -hmm. prospects, right? The famous Hunan letter on the, on the Hunan peasantry is 1927. But, the, so, but if China had been a little bit closer to the former for Russia, in a terms of more urbanized society, yeah, it would yeah. have been different, right? Because that's why possibly, I, might... I mean, you know, if we read it off of, of urbanization level, will create. But a lot of this revolutionary stuff is, you know, strategy, politics, cunning, uh -huh. working uh -huh. around an adversary. Uh -huh. uh, and I will say this: that it would be an interesting historical counterfactual experiment to go back and see if if the Communist Party had done what the in, in Shanghai had done what the Communist Party in India had done, which is put aside these, these ideological things and this you know, class discussion and, and just go live with the workers, work with the workers, find out what they're, this is really what um, this guy, uh, Li Li San, mm -hmm. was doing. And mm -hmm. you know, he, got, he was very successful, in fact, in Shanghai mm -hmm. um, in, in connecting with the workers on a cultural, social level. You know, so many of these communists would come in and start talking about the proletariat and class exploitation, and you know, the workers would leave the room and say, <laughs> too boring, right? But, but Li Li San was very good at manipulating folk tales and, and religious uh, you know, references and things like this. Mm -hmm. So had he been able to, uh, and he was almost able to um, you know, really lead a sustained movement, then it, it could have been an interesting story in Shanghai. And so my last question has to do, so again, reading this sort of your description and the interesting, uh, sort of what you called encompassing comparison of mm -hmm. Bombay and Shanghai in terms of how protests and local politics actually lead to, you know, real change, right? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of a book I think was published last year um, by um, 
uh, I forgot her first name, but Kaufman, it's called Reading Protests. Mm -hmm. And it really looked at uh, the one in the Arab world and all of that, in which that mass protest, despite, and then you know, the women's marches and all of that, yes. despite of their massive scale and their uh, clearly unified theme, right, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is extremely challenging to actually achieve um, sort of some somewhat permanent change and also somewhat uh, uh, fundamental change. And the book also outlined uh, the civil rights movement and how the um, African-American community very strategically used the Rosa Park as sort of this, the, the important symbol of inequality to really achieve that and how they actually worked with congressional, uh, you know, so different senators to mm -hmm. get to a point where um, there's sufficient support, right, yeah. in, uh, uh, on the Hill. So I'm very kind of uh, um, interested in knowing uh, to, so some of the changes you outlined for Shanghai that, you know, obviously yes. that was over, sort of put aside because of regime change, right? But to, to what extent some of these changes brought by by the protests both in both cities have been long lasting or had had impact on uh, subsequent uh, politics and, 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 and mm -hmm. you know, quality of life in that sense. Uh, and do we want to, can we narrow it to like, I mean, do you want to talk about the 20s, 20s protests, oh, no, yes. the 50s the, 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 protests? The, yeah, the, or the, only okay. the, the 20s. Okay, you know, so okay, you, good. You're focusing on that, <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the clearest example to go back to that one is that, that the May 4th um, so sets the stage and, 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 and provides the playbook for the May, the May 30th movement. And that one, and I don't talk quite enough, I think, in the book, um, could be more bonus content, but the, the, May 30th, the, the, the May 30th movement and the general strike that summer so ter terrifies the ruling authorities, both Chinese and foreign in Shanghai, that there are all of these um, um, kind of moves to co-opt and to, to reform the electoral system, to do something about the taxes, to, uh, you know, institutionalize. I mean, this is the, the typical, one typical reaction from a government when facing lots of protest is to, you know, of course, repress is one extreme, violently repress is one extreme, but uh, eventually there are those in the government who say, hey, let's, you know, Let's let them elect representatives to this council, and then that will probably get, won't get rid of the hardliners, but it'll get rid of, of it, it will dampen the enthusiasm of, of the protesters. So there's a lot of that response going on in, uh, in Shanghai in the, 1920s, in the late 1920s. And of course, the, you know, the, the thing that, that um, is an exogenous event that happens in many ways is the, the Northern Expedition, as I just mentioned, and where, where we're going to, you know, the nationalist government is going to take control of Shanghai in, in, by 1927. And in 1928, Shanghai becomes the, you know, special municipality, the Tabi Shur, and the capital of the Nanjing government is in, of Nanjing government is in Nanjing. The nationalist government move it from Beijing to, to, to Nanjing. So some of those incremental, changes in response to protests in Shanghai get disrupted by that whole regime change that happens in 28, 27. And in Bombay, um, the, the continued levels of protest, you know, lead to, you know, everybody thinks, um, and I did certainly before I got into this, that, okay, pre-1947, there's colonialism and the British run everything. And then after 1947, Nehru run, and the Indian National Congress run everything, but that's completely inaccurate. The British do so many of these electoral reforms that by 1938, the Indian National Congress is running uh, Bombay. And, and what they're doing is they are very, as I write about in the book, they're very astutely saying to the textile workers, okay, you have this union and there's only one union and there's only one representative and you can't go on strike unless you follow the whole complicated labor laws and a whole complicated electoral system that you know, it doesn't eliminate strikes and eliminate uh, popular protests, but it certainly uh, channels them in a, in a different uh, direction. So in that sense, those, those institutional, co-opting institutional changes are a kind of response to the, the protests in, in Bombay. Yeah. Thank you. I think Thanks. we should open yeah. up. Yeah. Do I take the question? You, you, okay, you, you, I'll, you I'll take so maybe <laughs> from here. Yeah. Just introduce yourself. 
Okay, uh, Larry. My name's uh, Larry Gridwell, and uh, I teach international business at Pace University. And I yeah. was in uh, Hong Kong over Christmas. I love the lights. That's why I go to Hong Kong at Christmas, and I go on the, the boats to see all that stuff. But I spent half a day at the Ledgeco, and I was talking to staff who are in their early 30s. Mm -hmm. And what kind of surprised me, uh, especially for that age group, they were thinking that in 2047 that uh, Beijing takes over because that 50 year grace period and I was thinking people in the 30s thinking that far ahead and then when you put up there that you know what one and a half million two and a half million um, I'm just struck by how strong they feel and then you know, I've yeah. been to China several times I could easily see China just saying, forget Hong Kong, we're just going to cut it off. You got Shenzhen next door and you got Guangzhou, they can run the economy. It's what, three, four million people in Hong Kong? It's about four or five, yeah. Seven points. Oh, seven. Oh, it's, seven. Seven. Oh, it's yeah. big. Yeah. It's big. So uh, I, I'm just kind of, um, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent the communist government is going to allow this to happen because I'm not sure how much they need out of a country of one and a half billion people, how much do they need these seven million troublemakers down in Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. So I'm interested so, in... So, in yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, in terms of, yeah, so a response to the protests. One, one is, as people have feared, you know, that there'll be this some kind of June 4th replay and sending in, that's... I think unlikely, but another is uh, a repressive move that is, uh, you know, could include martial law, could include various kinds of, of police action, uh, stronger police actions taking place. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you identified, there is this um, moment that, there is this sentiment among many Hong Kongers that the, um, we're, we, it, it's, this is, there's no hope. And therefore, if there's no hope, then there's no hope, easy decision to, to go out and, and resist and protest. So uh, the, the timeline is creating, a, even though it's 20, 20, eight, uh, 20 years, uh, 20, 27, 27 years out, uh, I think is especially. And they told me that. Yeah, <laughs> that it's there. Um, so like I said, I think, you know, imagine, Imagine if we were in this room in 1919 and it was just, um, you know, uh, where we are in the Hong Kong protests, June, July, August, <laughs> September, three, three or four months in. But in, Hong, in, in Shanghai, they're in for a 10 year. So I think in Hong Kong, we're in for a 10 year. Mm -hmm. uh, th this, 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 this business that I was showing you from the New York Times, you know, that, that's going to, that's not going to stop on October 1st. This is going to, what, what do you think uh, next July 1st will look like? Uh, you know, for the, the, that's the anniversary of the, um, mm -hmm. the uh, 2003, well, it's the anniversary of the handover, right? But it's also, um, you know, that, that is, has been frequently a day of big protests. But, you know, wait till, um, and I, I hate to predict it, but I, I think it's, it's, we already saw the teenager being shot, and then just wait till one of the protesters dies at the hands of police. That's going to escalate a massive, massive uh, round of new protests. As, as the, the government, the Hong Kong government responds to demands to punish this person who used excessive force, as Beijing. So it, it's a cycle. But, but I think, you know, from Beijing's perspective, why do they need Hong Kong? Is your, your point. And, I still think that there are, uh, you know, if you are a Chinese, if you're a PRC citizen and an entrepreneur, Hong Kong is important for you for rule of law, protecting financial assets and this sort of thing. You get a better uh, hedge. So uh, I think there's a question here and then in the back, yeah. yeah um, oh, Martin, I'm with QE in Columbia. Mark, I'm yes. not leaving because of the Lili San thing. I interviewed one of Lili San's daughters. And, oh, you did? And there's a very subtle thing about, it's true he didn't suffer during the Cultural Revolution the way Chen Yuxu did, or the reputation. Mm -hmm. But this goes back to the whole question of the Comintern and the implication that Mao's role has been 
very much exaggerated because as you know as well as I do, with 27 Mao was hardly. Yeah, he was um, nobody. <laughs> right. Yeah. And this thing about the urban thing is very important because, you know, it led to the whole part of these Trotsky's purge. So the whole right. Time was right. Gone. Yeah, there's a, a funny um, Elizabeth Perry who wrote this wonderful book about the coal miner strike in Hunan province in Anyuan in 1922. Um, you know, and she says the, the, the biggest role was Li Li San and then um, uh, Liu Shaoqi and then Mao. But if you go to the, the actual site, the statues are Mao, uh, Li Li, uh, uh, Liu Shaoqi, and Li Li San. <laughs> I was on the camp. I'm a retired French service officer who spent time in both countries. Uh, I was wondering, you, you talked about the concept of Shermin. Yeah. I wonder if you found anything comparable in India. I can think of Swadeshi, which is of the country, of the land. Yeah, and, and self, uh, Swaraj, Swadeshi. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I asked so many people. So there is a word, you know, Nagarik is the word in Hindi for. Uh, Citizen, but it's also, you know, our word in English, citizen, is civitas and civic, and it comes, it has this notion of, of being urban means to be a citizen, right? Going back to the polis in Greece, uh, as the citizenship was if you lived in the polis, if you lived in the city. So we, and we draw it from the Latin. So I think Nagarik is, is also kind of just adopting that notion of, of urban resident, but it is a close, you know, and Shermin may be doing that too, uh, but it is. Um, what I couldn't find, to kind of my disappointment in some ways, was that nobody's using that term. Um, in, in fact, in, uh, when you see protests and you say people were, I'm speaking in the name of, uh, you know, it's often, if they use the word citizens in English or Nagarik in Hindi, it's, it's citizens of India. As a citizen of India, I deserve access to education in this Bombay school. In, in New Delhi, in Delhi, interestingly, there is more. The NGOs and the social movement people will say, citizens of Delhi need to mobilize. And to, so in that sense, they're, they're using a more of a Shermin. But what's also really interesting, and, and you know this better than I do, but uh, the urbanization plans and you know, how you're going to absorb uh, 270 migrant workers, million migrant workers in, in Chinese cities uh, as China rapidly urbanizes and becomes, you know, someplace with an a, a, a urban population of one billion pretty soon. Um, the, the discourse in the media and in the official documents is how are we going to Shermin Hua mm -hmm. these migrants? How are we going to urbanize them? How are we going to urban citizenize them? So it means how are you going to get a migrant, how are you going to um, a, uh, um, give a migrant access to public services in the city, but also how are you going to kind of civilize them so that right. they behave like uh, an urban resident? So this this uh, Shermi Hua discourse is pretty interesting, I think. Yep, over there. Hi, I'm Wendy, I'm an undergraduate student from Hunter College, mm -hmm. and um, I'm just kind of curious about um, the. F so you got, you were talking about the. Um, just now about the urbanization of these migrant workers, and I was wondering whether the physical space in which you know these people are starting to inhabit and you know gain access to have been you know planned or designed in a way that makes it so that these protests or like civic state spaces become, I guess, difficult for anything to I guess spark. Um, you talked about it from mm -hmm. I'd like to say more policy perspective, which is like yeah. you put so many. Um, which is when you know the government puts a lot of blockades on how, um, like, under what circumstances strikes happen. But I was wondering whether the physical space has changed as well, and whether that's a consideration when they do plan these spaces. I mean, I would say that in the, the thing that got me thinking as you were raising the question is also in the contemporary period is this um, the the space of the urban village, you know, which is the the te technically collective land on which these people who used to be farmers are now apartment landlords and they're renting these these spaces to uh, rooms to migrant workers at the, as the only avenue of affordable housing but what's happening in especially in Beijing Shanghai Guangzhou Shenzhen um, is uh, and most famously in in November of 2017 was this campaign by the Beijing government to wipe out 
all of these uh, urban villages after there was this big fire near the Fourth Ring Road uh, that killed a lot of migrants and, and their kids. And so the Beijing government, far from sending someone to sympathize and, you know, express condolences, said you have, to, you have 48 hours to be out of here. Your businesses, your living. So it is a direct, um, you know, the space is, this is a illegal space. And you are, uh, you are not citizens, you're citizens of the PRC, but you're not citizens of Beijing, and we're going to launch this crackdown because our goal in this urban, territorial urban space of Beijing is to lower the population from 28 million to 25 million, same thing in Shanghai, gonna ratchet the pop. So this is where uh, territory and space can define conceptions of citizenship. There were no protests by the migrant workers, they were driven out, one interesting, uh, slide I have on another PowerPoint is is uh, uh, someone from, I think from Henan saying, why are they treating us like foreigners? We're we're citizens of the PRC, but we're being treated as though we were from, you know, North Korea or something. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. To follow up, I Please. urge you to work with the National Committee. Um, would you analyze social media and technology as a space of protest as well? And if so, do you think that the cyberspace decreases the power or the importance of physical space for protests, or is going to substitute it eventually? Yeah, I mean, that is, I, I, the short answer is that there is a, a sentence or a paragraph at the very end of the book where I say, this is a, a, an unanswered question in this book, and it is worth a great deal of future research, uh, because you could say on the one hand that as we're seeing in Hong Kong, I mean, without the social media, it, it, you would not be able to be water and just suddenly congregate in all these places. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, with technological governance and, and all sorts of surveillance capacities, that space can be a space, a space of repression, certainly, too, right? So you, there's this uh, battlefield of, of, of organizing, yet hiding one's identity, hiding one's metro card, hiding one's phone, using burner phones, all of this, that uh, will be uh, a, it's certainly a new battlefield for, um, for contentious politics, yeah. Okay, unless we have any less, last questions, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank both of you for doing this. It, I think Bridget's last question sort of indicates that even though you go back historically to the early 1900s uh, and bring us up to now, there's a whole new world yeah. out there for everyone to have to consider when it comes to um, both the process of urbanization and the process of how people are going to be governed yeah. in a way Digital that hopefully governance. reduces right. the need for such protests and such divisiveness that <coughs> we're seeing today. So. Join me in thanking both of you.